Hello, and welcome back to Consumer Behavior with Dr. Greer. I am so excited for today. Um, everything up to this point has been like external things that I think just happen to people. Uh, we are gonna start digging into what gets me really excited about marketing, which is perception and the internal psyche of what's going on. And this is really the stuff that just gets me excited about marketing all the time. So let's, without further ado, just jump right into it and start. So we're in this frame, this framework, and we've moved from external influences into internal influences. And I actually think this is where a lot of marketing decisions are made. And so this is the part that we can start really tweaking with people's brains <laughs> is a way to look at it, but also to start using the things that are already in their heads. So hopefully you've got a pen and paper ready so you can take some notes because this is some really juicy stuff that I think is valuable. And we're gonna talk about um, overall perception is what we're gonna cover today. But as we go through this course, we're gonna talk more and more about how to apply that into marketing. And hopefully you can gather some of that today as we go through this. So we're gonna talk about perception, uh, exposure, attention, and interpretation, and how we, uh, perception can enhance strategies for retailing, branding, advertising, packaging, all that stuff. So let's just jump right into perception. What is the nature of perception? Um, it goes through these four phases, and it, it kind of starts off with exposure. Was it a random exposure or a deliberate exposure? How, how did that happen? Um, and I would say, is the consumer looking for the exposure or did they happen upon it? So if you are looking for a, and I know this is a bad example, but a taco shop, and you come across a Del Taco ad versus if you're just driving down the seat and you, or driving down the street and you see a Del Taco, that's kind of random versus I was looking for something and got it. Then comes the attention aspect of perception which is, do I have to give it a lot of attention or do I not? And so high involvement attention means I'm actively reading something, I'm actively viewing it. Uh, low involvement is, yeah, I. it's just kind of, oh, it's off to the side there. Interpretation, do I have to think about the ad or the marketing material? Do I have to do something about it? So high involvement versus low involvement. And finally, is it going into my short-term or long-term memory? And there's a lot of different things. We'll talk about this a lot in the next couple chapters. And then how does it come out to, so how, how does that filter, let me rephrase it. How does it filter through my memory? And then do I purchase or not? That's that's where it goes into. So perception is a very interesting little animal and we're gonna cover all of these. So let's talk about exposure. There's a couple different types of exposure. The first one is selective exposure, which is, uh, a major concern for people like you and I, because if we fail to get, I like to call this one attention. So if, if we fail to get the attention, then we've not done anything. And I'm gonna refer back to the, the example I gave, I think in the first or second week, which was in the 1950s, Ford ran an ad in the Reader's Digest magazine. And they did a study afterwards and found out that more people bought Fords that did not see the ad than did. And so what is the cost of the exposure? If we run a marketing piece that has negative consequences, did we even want them to have exposure, uh, the, the consumers? Or if we, we run a good piece, now I don't think any of us is intentionally going to go out and run a marketing piece that's negative. However, it can happen and it can have dramatic effects on what's going on in your company. So the next one is voluntary exposure. Um, although you know a lot of us often avoid commercials and other marketing stimuli, sometimes we actively seek them out for various reasons, including if we wanna buy something, we wanna be entertained, um, some kind of information that we're looking for, we will voluntarily go out and expose ourselves to that. Now let me give you a good example. When I'm buying a car, I look at all the car ads like i will start scouring the internet i love to go buy newspapers i never buy newspapers but i'll go buy newspapers just to get to that little auto section see the deals that people are running and so i'm i'm actively going out and looking for the marketing materials of the company <clears throat> um so that's a, that's an interesting concept to me is that you know there's sometimes that we don't want to and sometimes we do I think a great example of this, and uh, DVR is getting a little antiquated, but let's just say, like I use YouTube TV at home. 
um, I record everything that I'm gonna watch because I don't want commercials. I do enough marketing on my own. <coughs> I don't like to be exposed to it unless I'm doing it for research. Typically, I try not to look for uh, commercials on anything I have because I already know what's going on. And like like I said, there's there's times when I'm like, okay, you know what? I need to look at what's going on in the world right now. I'll spend a couple days watching commercials, just watch commercials. But for the most part, I don't want to spend that time. So I, I know what's happening. I know they're marketing to me and I'm just not interested. However, companies have uh, realized this and cable providers. Now, how do they keep the lights on? It's an interesting paradigm that we have shifting right now in the United States where if you go to someone like YouTube TV, now YouTube TV is like a cable provider, right? So I have them, I pay them and I don't wanna see commercials. And so it's really interesting because sometimes there's no local commercials because they haven't sold those commercial spots. And other times there are, uh, well, but how, how, do the, how do the shows that are on YouTube TV pay for that show and it's through advertising. So we kind of have this like fighting concept that goes on between everybody. And um, if you've ever paid for like ad-free Hulu, stuff like that, well, okay, that's great. I played for Apple TV Plus, I paid for Netflix. Uh, the money that we give them is what supports that network. However, we can't do that with all networks, so that's why we have cable. So uh, DVR, digital video recorder, has really taken off. This was done 10 years ago on this slide here, so I would say it's probably more like 80 or 90% of households now have DVRs. And some of the strategies that companies have been employing are you know, doing shorter ads, uh, still frame ads, where it's that you can see the ad even if you're scanning through, um, maybe an interactive thing. I think a lot of people have tried funny ads where you pause it. My son right now loves Sonic the Hedgehog the movie. Anytime he sees me skipping through Sonic the Hedgehog, we have to rewind it and go back to it. Um, so there's there's just a bunch of different pieces, but I would say another thing that's happened is, have you noticed how movies are typically, you'll be watching movie, and as soon as it goes to commercial, it's super loud. Well, that's something that a lot of companies have done because they know you're probably gonna get up and walk into the kitchen during the commercial time, so they boost the volume of, of the commercial. So that's just an interesting piece of information there. It just shows us like we're trying to get that exposure. So when we look at attention, and, it, and the, the attention that we give to people or that we garner is typically determined by these three factors. We have stimulus factors, individual factors, and situational factors. Um, and, and so let's just go through the physical characteristics, the, um, the individual characteristics, and the situational characteristics. <coughs> So when we talk about getting that attention, a lot of it could be like, how big is the ad? How intense is it? What position is it? Where is it? Uh, is it like a big white screen with one piece in the middle? We'll see one of those in a second here. Um, is there contrast in the coloring? That's the stimulus factor. Like, does it, have you ever just like seen something that looked over, oh, or you're at the movie theater and they, they open up the can of, of Coke and you hear the tingling and the popcorns going, stuff like that. Those are all stimulus that, that are getting your, you're like, oh, I'm used to that sound. It's almost Pavlovian at that point for us. Um, when we look at where we place the ad, so like on this screen here, this Volkswagen logo is really big right in the middle and then just a little small one up on top. High, you know, There can be different high impact zones. If you go to the Smart Lab, some of the really great work that um, that they're doing over there is eye tracking and trying to see what parts of something are people looking at. In fact, I was over there with some of the professors looking at a demo and, then, and um, I can't remember which professor was showing me this, but they were showing me that there was uh, like a million dollars spent, I think it was on an Annie's macaroni uh, box and they had one of the macaroni noodles in a little smile and they thought that was super important. But as they did the ad track or the eye tracking <clears throat> on that, no one ever looked at it. <laughs> and so the, then lies the question, is it actually just making people happy that the macaroni noodles there? Why is nobody looking at it? And it's pretty fun. If you ever get the chance to go over to the smart lab and, and experience that, it was fun to put on the equipment and, and have that process done for myself to see what I was looking at in some, in some marketing materials. Um, when we talk about contrast or expectations, 
you know, what's what's in the foreground, what's in the background? Like why, or what is the colors? Um, and, and then when we talk about adaptation level theory, one of the concepts is if I was to sit here every day and like show you a scary movie, let's just say, over time, scary movies wouldn't be so scary to you anymore. Like slowly but surely that just becomes, yeah, that's not as important. And so we need to understand that if we do something too often, it can actually have a negative effect. And it could actually, well, not a negative effect, it just has less of an effect. And so that's an interesting way to look at some of these stimuli factors that we use um, that, that keep us there. So let's move on to individual factors really quickly here. Motivation and ability. Um, when we talk about this, it's like, okay, how motivated am I to want to know about this? And what's my ability to even purchase? I, let's just say, for instance, you're a college student, you're watching TV, and you see the most amazing Lexus commercial. And it's the top of the line Lexus. It's a $150,000 car. You have no ability to purchase that potentially or typically. So you're probably not going to be paying attention to that because you lack the ability to do that. Now in situational factors, how is this stimulus being put in there? Is it like, are we screaming at someone? Ah, but it's in the middle of a bunch of other people screaming so they can't hear. Is it being quiet? Is there clutter around it? And then I think another piece is, have you ever watched a movie if you couldn't pause it and it goes to a commercial and you are like, I don't want to miss the next scene. So you're going to sit there because you don't want to miss what's going to come up uh, on the next piece. So you might be very involved in what's going on willing enough to give enough attention to not miss what's happening there. So those are a couple of those little pieces. Um, based upon what's going on around us, we can see in this little uh, bar chart here, there are different types of involvement. So if we have low involvement, if we say, hey, recall reading an ad, it's much lower than the people who had high involvement in the actual content that was going around the ad. Um, I think we talked about this potentially last week where um, the YouTube labs that does all the YouTube stuff, they were saying that if people um, watch an entertaining ad that they don't think is an ad, they'll actually watch it for longer and not feel like they were advertised to even though they'll remember the brand just as much. So there's little things like that, like little um, pieces that we can look at in research that are always fascinating to, to see and, and to understand what's happening with it. So now let's talk about non-focused attention. These are things that happen subconsciously, essentially. So we have uh, two sides of our brain, and we have the left side and the right side. And the left side of the brain controls activities related to rational thought. So we don't use that when we're purchasing. <laughs> I like to say that all purchases are irrational decisions with rational reasons put around them to make. Um, the right side of the brain deals with images and impressions. And so the right side will see color and all that kind of thing. So we have two different pieces going on here. If, if we show a certain color, it might trigger a certain emotion in someone's brain. And we can also talk about subliminal stimuli. If you don't even know that it's happening, this used to happen to movie theaters, they don't do it anymore because it's illegal, but um, you'd be watching a movie and also know one frame of the movie would come up with a hot dog and go, wait, now you couldn't see it when you were watching the movie, but your brain would actually catch it be like, oh man, I feel like you need a hot dog or a popcorn, stuff like that. And so um, subliminal ads hide the key persuasive information within the ad, making it so weak that it's difficult or impossible for someone to physically detect. Even though our brains are picking it up, we don't know that it's happening. So um, the question becomes, okay, so if I'm trying to use subliminal advertising to, to get someone to buy a popcorn in a movie, that could be nefarious. What if it was cigarettes? Um, oh, that's really bad, right? Like we're trying to teach people smoking is good. What if there was an ad that said smoking is good in the middle of your movie and it happened like 50 times and you didn't realize it? Um, we might be anti that. But what if it was you should quit smoking? You should quit smoking. And it kept coming up. And I mean, should we be doing that? Should we be putting those positive, I'll say, with quote unquote, uh, messages in subliminally so it can help people. That's a that's why this is getting studied so much. Now there are different types of interpretation when we actually look at stuff and perceive it. Um, it's generally a relative process rather than absolute referred to as perceptual relativity. This means that we can look at something 
and we have a bunch of biases, biases. And we will sit there and a lot of times we'll see something and we have what I like to call, well, it's called confirmation bias. It helps reinforce something that we already believe um, and we're much more likely to receive that. Now, no political side here. I'm not trying to pick a political side, but if you are a left-leaning person, you probably like to watch CNN because they lean left in their commentary on politics and so it helps you reinforce what you think. If you're a right-facing person, um, you might uh, politically, you might wanna watch Fox News because they tend to skew right. So we have two different you know, delivery systems and people that watch Fox News probably don't like to watch CNN. People that watch CNN probably don't like to watch Fox News. That comes from this perceptual relativity, this interpretation of what's happening. This also happens in marketing when we're doing it. Um, one of the projects that I'm working on right now at doTERRA, we were having a big conversation about it. I'm like, look, we don't need to convince anybody. These people are already in. Like there was a specific marketing campaign. I'm like, we just need to reinforce what they're already feeling. And so that kind of changed the way that that marketing campaign was going. So um, it can be a cognitive thinking process or it can be an emotional one, something that injects emotion and helps people feel that they're right, feel that they are, uh, that they've made the right decision or that they're in the right direction. And I think a lot of good marketing keeps both of those in mind, the thinking and the feeling. So cognitive interpretation is a process whereby stimuli are placed into existing categories of meaning. Um, so we already, we put that in there and we say, all right, um, this came in and said that there's a sale, therefore it's a good deal, therefore I can be um, saving money and getting what I need. An affective interpretation is the emotional feeling or response triggered by an ad or some kind of stimuli. So um, that could be like, oh, um, I just saw a bunch of beat dogs that are being abused and they need to be rescued and I need to go do that because I, I see suffering and so it hurts me. Um, that's kind of like, you know, it's an emotional response, not a, you know, well, there are probably too many dogs to adopt in the world. You know, like there's a, there's a whole cognitive thing, but it's a different aspect and a different side of the brain that we're going after. So when we interpret things, when we actually take all this information and we start doing something with it, it's typically interpreted with three characteristics. The first one is individual characteristics. Then we have situational characteristics. And then we have stimulus characteristics. So let's talk about individual characteristics. Individual characteristics are traits, uh, learning and knowledge, expectations, things that you have and that you bring to the table. Um, if I sit down and watch an ad about a great leader, okay, I have a PhD in leadership, I'm gonna start going through, my learning and knowledge is going to have me start like looking into my background saying, okay, did that person use that or this? Um, if, um, if I was asked like, what's my expectation of good, I'm trying to think of good purchase that I could do, but how, how do I feel like um, a car ad should look like? I'm gonna go into the certain traits that I'm looking for. There are individual characteristics that I have that I might be pushing onto what I'm expecting. Now that's where demographics can come in and they really help us going backwards in this class. So we can say, hey, those are some of those pieces, but I'm gonna interpret them as part of me. If I saw, for instance, um, someone, no judgment here, but let me just say, if I saw some someone that had you know, shaved head mohawk, uh, piercings and tattoos all over their face saying, hey, come on down and talk to me about a product, I, probably not gonna be as, you know, as excited as seeing someone in a polo shirt, <laughs> um, you know, just because that's me. And so that's like one of those little traits that we can have. Um, traits are physiological and psychological traits. So they drive our needs and desires. These traits influence how a stimulus is interpreted. That's why I go back to this confirmation bias. We, we see other people um, and, and to be truthful, most of us wanna see ourselves. That's what we're trying to see is, is, is this person identifiable? Um, I know that a lot of females find Jennifer Gardner, for instance, very relatable. She's so real. I hear that all the time when I, I talk to people. In fact, I use Jennifer Gardner whenever um, I'm talking about how do we want to speak to people. 
um, as a female voice, if it's in a marketing piece, I, I would say think Jennifer Garner, you know, and that helps people really quickly. Oh, that's how we want to we want to have the physicalistic or the physical and characteristic traits going on there. Um, so when we take those individual characteristics, things that are around us, natural things such as time, space, relationships, and colors, are learned and why very widely across cultures. So we can learn that. You know, certain colors mean certain things. Now, in this one, I think that the color here in this ad is made to make it look sophisticated and edgy. So we're trying to show, you know, sophistication. There's red with the yellow, and there's a white and black. So it's monochromatic besides those two colors. Um, it's it's an interesting way to just interpreting it. When we look at our expectations, we typically want to say, okay, if I was to ask you before I showed you this slide, which one of those orange juices do you want to drink? I'm going to guess that 99% of you are going to go for the Tropicana Pure Premium Home Style. And it's probably just because the brand looks more you know, expensive. And it looks like they put a little effort into it and then a bunch of random oranges with orange juice and some weird font on there. We'll talk about fonts here in a minute. So it is an expectation. In fact, my, my family, we love, I think it's Fair, Fair View, Fair Life, some kind of milk. But we're, we all have to drink lactose-free milk. And I, you know, when I go to the store, there's lactate and this fair life or whatever, but it's in a, like a different container and it has a better lid, I think. And so we, we get it almost because of the packaging, even though it's chocolate milk. Like if you were to put both of them in a cup, I probably couldn't tell you the difference, but um, that's what we do. It's, you know, it's our expectation of what that product is. And so then we can move into situational characteristics. The situation provides a context with which Focus stimuli is uh, focus stimulus. I'm sorry, is interpreted. So, the contextual clues they help us figure out like outside of what's going on in the marketing, like how does it fit? And I think that's a good way to put it. So, like if I'm at the um, if I was at home and I saw one of those popcorn and uh, Coke commercials that they show at the movie theater. I probably would be less likely to want to get popcorn. In fact, the movie theaters train me really well. I don't normally eat popcorn unless I'm there. Then I'll, you know, I'm trained enough now, like a monkey, where I'll go out and get the popcorn before I even come in because I don't want to think, oh, I want popcorn. And and so that's just what happens. It's like, okay, if I'm at the theater, I need popcorn. Do I need popcorn if I'm at the theater? I mean, technically, no, but they've trained me with their marketing that I do. Um, when we look at stimulus characteristics for interpretation, we, we can see a bunch of different pieces here. And I'm going to show you an ad in this next one. So like on this ad, it's trying to insinuate that at one o'clock in the afternoon, it's a perfect time to go get an egg McMuffin. And it's doing that by giving us a clock, putting the advertisement there. And I think it's almost reinterpreting or reanalyzing um, I think Jim Gaffigan's the one who has a great uh, little bit that says, you know, thank you, McDonald's. If you hadn't told me that breakfast stops at 1030, I'd still be eating, eating eggs at 11 like a moron. You know, <laughs> so McDonald's is very effective in helping define to the U.S. market that breakfast stops at 1030. And it was because of their advertising, you know, and so this is them almost reversing that, say, hey, we actually do serve breakfast at one if you want to come get this. So um, a lot of times what we do is we make inferences. And so based on the quality, uh, interpreting images, missing information or ethical concerns, I would say that um, a great example of the inferences on this are when Carl's Jr. was using scantily clad women to eat hamburgers. And, you know, automatically my wife interpreted that as, you know, horribly like misogynistic or more objectifying of anything that there was ethical concerns of objectifying women uh, in these scantily clad clothes eating hamburgers that she didn't want my daughter to see and pff, just shot Carl's Jr. for her forever. Okay, so now, was it a good or bad ad campaign? I wouldn't have run it, but I'm just saying like, I don't know if Carl's Jr. has done better or worse since then, but it definitely turned off people like my wife from Carl's Jr. ever. So we just wanna make sure that we keep clear with that. We know what we're doing with those things. Uh, as far as perception and marketing strategy goes, coming up to the end here, now we get to sit back and say, okay, based on these things that we know people are going to be looking at, 
what are some ways that we can use this now um, I'm just gonna there's a lot in this chapter you can go ahead and read it on your own but I just want to talk about the typography for a minute there's a great little um, side I guess documentary you can go watch called Helvetica and if you are serious about marketing I would recommend watching Helvetica there's another one called objectified it's a little more nerdy and fun about how we use products but I think Helvetica is a really good introduction if you've never taken like a graphics class or something like that. Um, it's a documentary about the font Helvetica. And it explains the difference between serif and sans serif and just all these different types of fonts and why Helvetica is in so many places. Um, I'd be interested to know if anybody knows what font I'm using in this PowerPoint presentation. That would be interesting to know. And there are different responses that people have for different fonts. So if you don't know what a serif is, you're gonna have to go look it up and figure it out. But if you use a serif font, it insinuates something to someone automatically when they're reading it or seeing it. Um, if you use something like uh, papyra, uh, papyra, <laughs> papyra um, the font, it's a horrible font. No one wants to use it, but everybody started using it. It looks like the Egyptian font. And a lot of people started using it. It was like, this is not a good look. Um, brush script is another one. It's kind of like you just know someone didn't know what they were doing when they did it. So I think that typography is something that does a lot of insinuation to people. And I would challenge you to go take the extra time I'm giving you from not giving a long lecture this week and watch Helvetica. It's I think it's probably available on Netflix. I own it on my iTunes account. It's It's worth it. But these things play into how we see um, and interpret and perceive the packages that we get when you you, you know when you buy a new product and you look at the box the, the way the box says things and where the font is and what color the font is and what font it is those are all you know if it says what's up dog versus hello and welcome to our community like there's so many different perceptions that happen with all those interactions and I think far too often we just take our version of reality and we put it into our marketing. So I'm going to challenge you to read through this chapter to start looking at how you're perceiving stuff. I'm not saying you have to change anything but I am saying in fact it's a great time right now uh, to watch political ads because we're coming up on a primary season and just see like okay in political ads what are the different stimuli that they're using what are the different colors and fonts and and how do they like where do they position the image and the font and and these kinds of things because those are meant to be very attention grabbing very confirming or very convincing of someone who's already in one position to switch so um, I really appreciate you being here with me this week and I will talk to you later thank you very much